so yeah, I got so I got I got that bio from your uh, Spotify. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm like, well, let's go see what Johnny's all about. Let's get some uh, background info, and that's all that was there. <laughs> that's all. That's all. It's about me, man. I've I've but, wiped. I, I didn't want the people to know, man. I wiped everything, man. I know. Well, all that work being mysterious, uh, we're gonna have to demystify it today. But uh, but it does sure. tell you a little bit about something about you. You know, it shows you got a funny sense of humor shows that you like point break great movie by the way <laughs> are you a point break fan I, I i'm a fake point break fan and what i mean by that right. is my uh maybe three and a half years ago my now bass player elliot he's the one who texted me and was like yo i really think you need to watch this movie point break and then uh -huh. that's when i watched it and i got the name johnny utah but i i can't fake flex he put me on to it right right yeah i think you even to like that movie most people i think who like it like myself like it in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way it's like you know it's it's like bad good good bad Dude, you know i i'm very fucking happy to hear you say that because i went on uh do you know like those genius behind the lyric videos things uh-huh yeah with the yellow backing i went on one of those and i said that i was like oh yeah it's like Dude, it's like the best, worst Keanu Reeves acting, right? Yeah. Thinking that that's yeah. like normal. Everyone thinks yeah. that way. And I got, yeah. yo, I'm like not kidding right now. I got like shit on, on the internet. Where people, <laughs> You're going to call Keanu Reeves like a bad, a bad acting? Bad acting. <laughs> Bro, it's like, come on. It's like cheesy good. Like that's what makes the movie good. Is it like totally. it's bad good, but it's like great. But it's yeah. terrible, but it's yeah. great, you know? Like Yeah, it's like it's like, you know, like rock and roll music sometimes, you yeah. know. It's it's you can't exactly. take it too seriously, but it doesn't mean you can't love it. People out there that feel that way because I thought that was just the broad audience of young fans, but all these old head people were really mad that I said that. They're like really they love that movie for a different yeah. reason, I guess. Yeah, they have taken it too seriously, I think. Yeah. But uh yeah, it's funny because I feel like if you said that five, ten 10 years ago, I think everyone would be like, yeah, you know, I feel like Keanu Reeves used to get teased every now and then, but now he's like, he's like everyone's like favorite guy who, and I love him. Yeah. So I, I, because obviously I've loved him since that movie, but, uh, but you know, people, you know, they start I glorifying that. I've, I've heard that from people that are a bit, cause I'm 24, but I have mm -hmm. heard that from people that are older than me that like our generation, how we view Keanu Reeves was not like him in the nineties. Like, right. He's like, he's, he's like, kinda like the black now. sheep. People were like, Oh, that fucking guy. And then he well, went he, like, he was always awesome. I mean, he could Bill <laughs> I and Ted, so I Bill and awesome. Ted, I was, same thing. It was like, it was like awesome in a bad way, bad, awesome, you know? So. Yeah. He he just you know he, he branched out and started doing some other things so good for him. The, I, I think the everyone. Matrix, With the Matrix, Matrix was like the turning say. point. Like they know? were like, whoa, this guy's for real. <laughs> That's when he became the one. <laughs> yeah, he was the chosen one at that point. Then he did like John Wick, right? Isn't he John Wick? Yeah, now he's John Wick. That's like his new trilogy. I think he's right. got a new he's got a new uh, a new Matrix coming out though possibly I hear so that that might be pretty epic. We'll see. Yeah, can I tell you a secret before we get into sure. everything? Sure. I've never seen. The Matrix ever. I don't know uh, a scene of it. I don't know the plot. I don't know anything. I've I've never seen Star Wars. I know about it. I'm not wow. stupid. I've seen the scenes. Yeah. I've never seen Lord of the Rings. These what about any of the new Star Wars? No. It's funny. I I'm not dumb though. Like I've I've, I've been in rooms where Star Wars is playing. <laughs> sure, I know sure. Star Wars I know who Anakin Scout. I know the storyline because right. I just feel like I've pop culture. Yeah. Times. Yeah. I've never in my conscious mind meaning when i'm not like five or six like i've never sat down and watched star wars and like digested it but same yeah. with the matrix and lord of the rings man. i almost i feel like if you watched it the original ones like maybe 10 20 years ago it would have still kind of held up but i've watched the original ones and the special effects are starting to wear but they really they lasted for a long time since it was yeah. so ahead of its time but i will tell you i recently rewatched the matrix and you have to watch the matrix at everybody least. says that you part know, one really part one that. part one okay part it, it'll blow you part yeah, just part, <laughs> Only part, one. part two and part three. If you love it, then you can watch those. But those are it's a different thing. You know, it's right. uh, they, I think uh, those are afterthoughts, I think. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I the only thing I know about the Matrix is when I was working uh, as a cook, there was this whole controversy where this this lady, um, this woman was like, they stole my it's, this is my book. Like they stole my idea. Like the, everything about it was my idea. The Matrix? I, think, I think they paid her off. Mm. In court. 
Interesting. Yeah, okay. or something crazy like that. I think they drug her out through court for like 15 years, and just like two or three years ago, she won. She won the whole case. That was her idea. The Matrix. Wow. Wow. You might have to fact check me, but I'm pretty sure this yeah, woman gonna, like I'm... won after 15 years of like fighting. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the the Wachowskis, the director directors who did that movie. Um, I have wondered. You know, they've they've come out with some decent stuff, but nothing as epic as that that first Matrix. So maybe maybe they did yeah, lift. It a little also bit. might be a coincidence. Maybe she happened to just write some ideas that happened to be in the movie, and then she freaked out. I don't know, but that's all I know about the Matrix, and I'm still gonna watch it. <laughs> it's such a crazy concept. I mean, I'm mean, I'm sure I'm not spoiling it for you. You kind of know the the concept uh, yeah, behind I it, right? That one too, I yeah. mean, it's such a crazy concept that people are saying that it's almost a a probability it's a higher probability that we're in a simulation rather than we're not that's like how yeah. influential that idea is you know but anyways let's let's get to you johnny <laughs> that's Me, what, not the matrix let's go that's what happens when you name yourself johnny utah we get on a, a keanu reeves tangent hey I, uh, i'm but, totally down to talk about that for an hour to be honest i'm, I'm yeah. the most not vain person ever so i'm down <laughs> to talk about everything else <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love to also but you got some uh a very interesting story to tell as well. So I'm stoked to yeah. hear this. Um, so I read your, you know, your, your spoof bio. Um, but uh, why don't you take us back to when you actually started, you know, listening and playing the music? Right. Okay. So outside of the spoof bio, the real bio of Jacob Solinger. Yes. You know, I'm a fraud. My name is Jacob. <laughs> um, I always came up around music. You know what I mean? My, my dad, very cool guy, very into like Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, all the old head shit, like loves right. it. Also loved the blues and he used to write a lot of blues reviews when I was a kid. Mm. Um, still worked his day job, but he just did that for fun. He would literally just like go to bars, go on his computer and like try to write reviews because he just always loved music and never could get into it. My mom, she's a legend. They were divorced, but she's always bumping Barbra Streisand in the house. She mm. loves... She used, to, she used to love the song Cotton Eye Joe, like unironically, <laughs> loved it. Like she yeah. just loved all types of music. My whole life I had it growing up, you know, I kind of had like a cool dad, played the guitar and stuff, cool mom. Um, and so then naturally I feel like I just, nav like I, I gravitated towards it by the time I was like a conscious age to like get my own interests, you know what I mean? Like, like seven years old, it's not really like what your parents give you as toys anymore. You kind of like start to be like independently i want to get into this that or the fifth yeah um and for me it was the guitar i feel like at like age seven when it was finally my my way of being like this is something that i want to do that like you guys aren't telling me that i should do and you're not giving it to me like this is just i'm telling you i want to get into this and they they were supportive my dad you know got me a little like beater guitar and i started playing it um that's and that pretty was young like, to, to want to pick up a to you know that's like second grade right yeah, it might even be later. I might have been eight. It is definitely yeah. like third grade for sure. Yeah. Um, were you doing anything like tinkering on a piano or anything before that? Or were you just like that guitar? That's what I want to play. I, I don't want to. I probably have, but not yeah. anything that like stood out to me. Right. Uh, it was definitely the guitar was the earliest like I gravitated towards it to where I was like, that they look cool. Like, I don't yeah, like yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was like a skateboarder kid in California, too. So I feel like just went hand in hand it goes hand in hand yeah surfer, totally okay okay you know? yeah and that, that was like sense. my bread and butter for a long time i was like i'm gonna be a rock star and i'm gonna play the guitar me and my brother we made this band solo sos with no other members just us and we never <laughs> wow. played a show we were like little kids no 12 year olds did no he play drums or what did he do he was playing the drums on that okay. one nice. i do play the drums uh and then i kind of lost it and what i mean by that is like I, I was like, I'm gonna be a rock star. Da, 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 da. And then, you know, reality kind of sits in at like 13 or 14. And then I started playing does. the guitar yeah. a little less yeah. and less, but it's still picking it up. But I was getting really into video games. Now I'm like a teenager. I'm going to ah. school and like the internet is a thing. And I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. Like, I'm just gonna play video games. And I did that kind of all throughout high school. Didn't do anything majorly music related throughout high school. I, I was producing beats like throughout high school, trying to be like a beat guy, make beats for rappers. But like, mm didn't really dive in right um what were you using to make your beats fl studio okay, same thing okay. that i use now i yeah, still dude, use it a lot i still of people use fl use 11 yeah. actually yeah uh which is like years and years old now but i refuse to change um then when i graduated there was a point where i i remember i was talking to my brother who also is a producer now we live together uh but he had taken it more seriously earlier than me. Like, so I was kind of still playing video games in high school and I was working on music, kind of dicking around. But he like at age 17 was like, 
the full on, like, this is what I want to do. And I hadn't fully hit that yet. I was still, still had a dad kind of, that was like, yo, you're a dreamer and all that kind of shit. Mm. But when I graduated, there was a moment where I was talking to him and I was like, damn, what if I just sold like right now, if I just sold all of my Xboxes and gear and all that shit, and I like bought a new laptop, like, would that be like a good decision? If I just like, was like, this is what I'm going to do. And he was like, yeah. And so I, I fucking traded in all my shit to GameStop and I got like a better computer. And I was like, now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take producing like a lot more serious. And that was like age 18. Uh, then I think by age 20, I started release music of myself on the internet slowly by slowly. 19, I was definitely releasing shit on the internet, but I, I would say 20 is when there was something like substantial there. 21, I started mm. releasing the songs with my voice on it. By 22, you know, I was doing the weird Twitter videos, trying to be like a funny Twitter kid. I was making music. I would say 22 is when it started to like happen kind of where like Spotify playlisting had just become a thing. There was no such thing as like submitting to a playlist. It was just these random strange sure. people that we we never knew who they were. Now I feel just like the mask is off a little bit, but back then yeah. it was secret. It was just secret yeah. curators. Yeah. And I was getting thrown on all these playlists when I was 22, just this is 2018. I was getting thrown on bedroom pop and ultimate indie and all these playlists. Like, and I just kept releasing music and it kept happening. And I was like, what is going on? Um, then by the end of 2018, it began prior, to feel prior like to that. Too. Were you just prior to that? Were you just releasing stuff on SoundCloud or something like it that? It was or, SoundCloud or, or and were Bandcamp. You always kind of privy to okay, Bandcamp and then SoundCloud and, then and Bandcamp. This, this is like 20. To, uh, 20 to 22 was like SoundCloud and Bandcamp because I didn't even, I feel like now everyone, re, re, they're like, yeah, like DistroKid, all this shit. We could just release on everything. And yeah, back yeah. then though, it was I didn't even know how to release on a DSP in like 2016. Like that was still kind of like the yeah. wild, wild west that normally people with like labels or like managers, they like knew how to do that kind of shit. I was just like, right. I don't know this world. There's not a lot of services now. Now there's like level, repost network, all, all these fucking services right. that help you do it. But back then it was still kind of like the wild, wild west. So I, I primarily was Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Then at 22-ish, 21, 22, I started to like figure out how to do the DSP thing. And right, my, right, I just yep. started putting up old music that I'd already released six months prior on dsps now and then they were getting on these like playlists i didn't really know what playlists were and i was like okay yeah. i'm just gonna drop another one and drop another one and drop another one and at that point i was getting these calls from managers and label people but i wasn't ready for it like they were like what's your plan what do you want to do and i was like i don't know i don't have a manager like i'm just dropping music and this shit's kind of like happening and da -da -da -da. like yeah. all those conversations ended like dead like at the door because they're like this kid has no fucking idea what he's doing um ah. and so i just continued to do that for another year until i met my now managers who were like yo like you got a good thing going we don't want to change anything we just want to we just want to help we're not going to take any money from you let us just work together and if you like how we work then like we could talk about everything later on down the road like I'm, this isn't a fucking scheme this isn't a pyramid scheme we're not taking any money <laughs> right. if anything we'll right. give you money we'll loan money but let, let's just try to work together because I really think that you have something here. And we began to work with each other for the next year and a half. And I already had my relationships myself at Spotify with these playlisters and at Apple Music, these playlisters. And we kind of just kept going and it, be, it started to become a way more real thing where I got to quit my job. And the story, you know, goes on from there where I signed to a major and, you know, got to continue to release music on this platform and level that I never thought when I was 16 I was going to be able to achieve um all the way to bringing us to right now where three days ago i just dropped my first like big body of work on like a major label which is wild because that's like you know when i was a kid and i was laying in bed like listening to these bands or whoever thinking like oh that'd be so cool if like i could do that one day right and then your parents whoever are like yo that's like the one in a million like don't get your hopes up it was a cool moment for me the other night to be like damn well you know what and like I'm not very vain or cocky, but like, I'm the fucking one in a million. Like I did that shit. I just had a project come out on a major label. Like that's a pretty sick deal. Like the shit that I used to talk about with my brother as a kid, like I did that now. And totally. it, it was a really cool full circle moment. And now I'm just going to continue on going. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing. The, the amount 
of streams that your songs have on I was, I was you know listening to you on Spotify is crazy. It's uh, it is kind it, of wild. Your, your single uh, "Honeybee" has seventy three million. Streams. Honeybee is by Unknown Mortal Orchestra. Mine's Honey Pie. I don't want to fake take fake credit. <laughs> okay, that's Honey Pie. Okay, but the same. It's the song. We know what the, we know what the song is. Right, right, and and <laughs> well, and and your the other songs, you know, like Crazy for Your Love, like five yeah. million. You got you got multiple songs in the millions, and uh, you know, just like thirty million monthly listeners. Um, so it it seems like it was a combination of the right music, the right time. You know, you you putting it on Spotify at the right time and, and the right curators hearing you and then just continuing to dig your stuff. Did was yeah. do you feel do you feel like you kind of uh, was consistency part of the formula? Do you think, you know, they, they heard you and then you were you how regularly were you dropping the music after the, you know, those first couple ones got picked up by playlisters? I, I actually have to give credit to when uh, when credit is due that. Mm -hmm. um I won't say any names, but I, I did get reached out to by an A&R from Sony Music before I ever even had um, managers. And he didn't even want to sign me. Just a complete homie shit where he was like, hey, listen, like we're not even at any point to have any conversations about signing or anything. You don't know what you're doing. Just hop on a call with me for an hour and I'm just going to tell you what I think you should do. And you can either take that advice or not. And what he had pretty much told me is he was like, you're on to something keep dropping just be consistent he's like you have these songs like every month every month and a half just keep dropping a song keep building this narrative that you've been building keep similar artwork and like whatever you're doing is working so don't don't get in your head and like stop now and think like oh i need to spend like six months to like make a project he's like no like just we're going into a new era where we're in the single era you, right. you just need to keep dropping for right now i'm building you're like a politician and he's like, when a politician's running for president, he needs to go out and get all of these people to be like, you need to vote for me. And right now, like, you need to just keep going out. That was what the analogy he used. He was like, yeah. you need to fucking round up the people and keep bringing them into this vision that you have. And I've, I've followed that. And I, I can't pretend like I came up with that myself, but he's he's the one that gave me that advice. Really nice dude. Genuinely wasn't one of these crooked monkeys in a suit he had no yeah. interest in me when the label meetings came we didn't even he didn't even try to poach me or anything he wow. genuinely was just a nice dude that wanted to give me some advice and so i followed that little blueprint until i met my managers and obviously we came up with our own game plan um but that's all just industry stuff at the end of the day it was just me I was just a kid, still am, making music, and I wanted to put it out into the world. And yeah, it may get a little hairy now down the line because now there's all these moving parts and people that work on a team of mine, but that's all it really is at the end of the day. It's that I just try to make cool music and I want to continue to just put it out and keep putting out a product that people can listen to because we, we live in a fucking never-ending industry of hottest flavor of the month and every week lady gaga megan trainer whoever is dropping another project or single and you're it's very easy to be forgotten about and so i think just continuing to give your fans like music's like a really important thing yeah and and what's great is you kind of had the formula down before uh you know before you you got the team so as long as you keep doing what you're doing uh they're just only going to amplify what you're doing yeah they're that's why when i was getting into so many I was saying a lot, manager, this, a and R, that. I, I had to follow it up with, like, that's all just, like, behind-the-scenes shit, though. At the end of the day, even now, it's just about music, man. That's all That's all it is. It doesn't change. You can have all the managers in the world and sound all fancy, but if your music sucks, people aren't going to resonate with it. You know what I mean? Like, the music's first every time. Totally. And I, I got to say, Ed, it's, it's fun talking to you because I feel like the your music, it's, uh, it's just fun. You know, it's fun you. and it feels positive. You know, it feels like feels like a ray of light. And uh, and when I'm talking to you, you seem like just a fun kind of positive person. Uh, where do you think you get that from? Uh, one, thank you. Uh, and two, definitely just being born and raised from like outside the Bay Area in California. And like my mom, my dad's from, you know, California, but my mom raising me there for the beginning of my life and getting that part of the world but also my mom was born and raised in new york so i got like a little bit of both personality like my my mom could fucking talk to anyone bro like talk their ear off like anybody any type of person any walk of life could talk to them for an hour if she really wanted to 
I think I got that from her. Um, thank God too, because that's helped me in every aspect of like relationships, romantically, anything. Um, and I feel like with the California, I got the energy of like just fucking at least where I was from in California, like no one, no one, no one gives a fuck like what color you are, if you're gay or anything, or at least like the the good vibe people that I was around, like they don't right. care about any of that. They just want to like have a good time, make their money however they make it, have a good life. Like no one, no one's really looking to fight or anything I've, I've never had like that fighter energy in me or anything i just feel like i've been raised by really calm level-headed open-minded people that have always taught me to just fucking love everyone and just be chill and thank god i had that upbringing i was around those people because there's people from other parts of the world that are around fucking shitty people that have different moral values you know what i mean i'm sure there's people in california that are like mad fucking racist or homophobic or whatever it is and that can really, I feel like, have an effect on somebody's energy for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? Like, you, sure. you look at some of these shitty people at 24, 25, and I'm not saying to feel bad for them, but then, like, you see their parents or someone, and you're like, oh, like, hmm. yeah, it kind of makes, you're just a fucking offspring of, like, terrible fucking individuals. Like, you right. guys just suck. <laughs> like, yeah, so, so, uh, so props to mom and dad, right? Yeah, and, that's pretty uh, much it, man. And, and also the, the neck and, of the woods. And Californication and all that, right? Um, yeah. So the – what I like about it too is, uh, you know, it, you know, it's all that that I just said it was. You know, it's positive. It's fun. But it, uh, but it still sounds, you know, relevant and hip, you know? Um, yeah. And, and so right. I definitely hear, you know, a little bit of the influence uh, – the influences that you said that you grew up with. You know, like I, you got the guitar. You're playing the guitar. But then, you know, the beats are a little um, – they're a little, I'd say that the genre is kind of blurred more with the beats. Do you think you bring over any of that hip hop beat making that you were doing in, yeah. uh, in high school over to your music? 175%. A lot of my music is um, with credit being due as well. Like it's a, it's fucking very hip hop R and B influenced um, by just like the giant movement of like black artists in the nineties, like, and fucking me growing up in California on like E40 and shit like that, just like yeah. legends or the hieroglyphics, like Pep Love and shit. Um, obviously just growing up in that era at the same time, you know, I'm hearing E40 and all this and this end of my ear, I'm hearing fucking Green Day, American Idiot coming out in like 2005, 2006, like being like the yeah. biggest record in California. Like, I just feel like having that fusion growing up, uh, it all affected me in like a butterfly effect up to now. You know what I mean? And then I made the hip hop beats like, and that's what I thought I wanted to do. And now I'm making like indie fusion music, but obviously just with every elbow that I bumped into in my upbringing and then everything musically that I was into, it's just like this weird fusion baby that I can't take a lot of credit for because it's on the backs of a lot of other people, you know? Totally. I mean, yeah, I have, everyone's got their influences. And uh, so yeah. You just dropped two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that that larger body of work that you said uh, for Abby. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and who's uh, Abby? gladly. Uh, so for Abby is a project that uh, it's complicated. Uh, Abby's not anybody, but she represents um, a lot of people, um, a lot of things that have closely just happened to me recently, or even things that happened years ago. Um, I was overseas. I'll go back a little further since we're, you know, backwards to forwards. Yeah, on bringing podcast. it backwards, yeah. I, you know, bringing it backwards. I fucking <laughs> did a bunch of singles, had what I thought was a body of work. I signed it onto a major label, that being Interscope. Thought that that's what it was, was chasing the follow-up to Honey Pie, just making all these fucking anthem songs that not all of them came out. Uh, went overseas in February, I was promoting one of those songs to all the Universal Music offices, went through a pretty messy public break, not messy, went through a pretty public breakup though. Um, and then just started rethinking everything. I was going on this tour. I'm playing for like Germany. I'm playing for like Australia. I'm playing for all these markets. I'm playing the song that like I had wrote maybe a month and a half ago, or two months ago, but I, I wasn't resonating with it anymore. And every night I'm like playing the song and promoting it. And by the end of the tour, I just felt like a fraud. Not that the song wasn't me. I was just like, damn, this, this is not what I, uh, this isn't me. This was not what I'm supposed to do, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm. And I went home into this empty house in the very beginning of quarantine. And I'm by myself 
like a little like heartbroken feeling weird can't see anyone and i'm listening to this song now because now it's out publicly on all dsps it's called anything you want um and i just called my team and i was like i i think i fucked up and they're like what do you mean and I, i'm like i really think that i need to like go back to the drawing board and i think if if you we call the label and we just ask for a little bit more time i really think i could put together like a project that's actually 100 me and we called the label and we you know we're like yo we you know jay wants to fucking scratch it which is very scary <laughs> how much, how much tell. did you scratch all of it i mean not, not the ones that were out obviously like honey pie oh. is already out and interscope right. owns that song 40 ounces out and interscope owns that song but anything that had not been out that they hadn't owned yet uh-huh. i was pretty much like i want to just scrap it and keep going and that sounds like a scary call to ask of the people that just gave you a lot of money to live very comfortably on to do that right before you're supposed to release something but they were nothing but supportive my a r aaron at the time and sam and everyone at interscope was just like dude like we we're not chasing the next viral thing you know what i mean we we're here to build artistry and we're here to build artist careers and like cool. if this is what your like heart is kind of telling i mean i'm paraphrasing now like sure. this, now i'm just speaking openly this is like quotes but it was pretty much in that vein of like you you're gonna make the body work you want to make let's just come up with a new timeline and figure it out and you know we had sat in a room busted it out and it just it all came together man i just started writing more songs i went the first song i wrote was sabotage after that conversation um i went in the room that day just really fucking hurt and that came out and then after that for abby was written then after that like another song was written and i finished the song super bad mantra and the pieces just kind of all started coming together um and then the body work kind of made itself in a weird way it's like i it, it was it was almost like i was drawing something with like a blindfold and i didn't know where it was going and then at one point i like pulled my blindfold off and i was like oh like three months ago when i said that line like that was what i fucking meant by that and like oh this song's definitely like about this and like it just all it kind of painted itself i i didn't really do much other than like vent on a bunch of songs that i made so a lot of this so this is like a quarantine album basically yeah it, it, uh, it was it was a, a lot of it was written uh people these past few months. have been asking me that though and i i have been correcting people though because i i truthfully think this record would have been made the exact same way if quarantine was going on or not because i i do make music at my house in my studio right i, I don't want to do the fake flex hot word quarantine thing where i'm like yeah this is like a quarantine record so right, that people right. listen to it for that uh and that's not even if, what I meant. If, if I came I, home and the world was not in the state that it was in right now, it, this record was still came out the same way. 90% of it made at my house because I just prefer to work that way anyway. And that's how all my other music is out. I right. actually don't have a song out right now that's ever been recorded in a professional recording studio. That's that's um, cool. And Interscope has been really supportive of that as well. There's a there's a there's a term in the industry called full creative autonomy. Mm-hmm. And I, I got that, man. And so I just they let me make my shit however I kind of want to make it. And they just trust me and uh, whatever comes out, comes out. And if it comes out bad and everyone hates it, then it's kind of my fault. I can't really turn to them and be like, yo, like you guys, what the hell? Cause they're going to be like, Hey, you have creative autonomy. Like yeah. this is your music. Like uh-huh. they didn't like it. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, and, that, yeah, that's and like, I wasn't even meaning, you know, theme wise or anything. I just meant, yeah. you know, these songs were all written in the past few months, huh? Factually, it was a yeah. factually it was a lockdown album. Yeah, yeah. And it so, was. And and so, and the so the production sounds great. So you're you're self produced. Uh, when when you're done with these tracks, do you send them? Are you collaborating on the mixing and the mastering? So I did. I would say as far as producing goes, I did about eighty percent of it by myself. Mm-hmm. um there's a few tracks on there that are 100 percent me like mm-hmm. you know honey pie and others 40 ounces are like 100 percent me um then i had songs where i i finished them like let's say a song like super bad mantra that song the whole bare bones and flesh of that song i 100 did about a year ago but then what i got to do is i got to bring in somebody like jason evigan who works on like a lot of radio songs a lot of big things and he would sit with my song and be like, oh, well, like, you know, what if we added like this in there? What if I put like this synth bass in there? And what if we changed this snare out for this? Uh, and he really just took my song that I was seeing kind of like, you know, in this square and just like turned it a little where I was like, ah, oh, like that's fucking awesome. 
And so I got to do that for a few of the songs. I got to do them with Jason. And then one of the songs I completely made with somebody else. I can't even take credit for producing it. I, I wrote a song called You Got a Man with my buddy Dan. And that one I can't take credit for producing the whole thing on because he's also a producer and we made that one together. But um, outside of that, as far as production goes, the, the whole rest of it was made by me at my house in my studio, whether or me and my buddy Jared in my studio or whatever it may be. Other than those few songs, it was completely self-produced in-house. That's awesome. They, I guess another word I would use to describe your music, and I'm wondering if if that's reflected in your writing, is there's kind of like an you know, like a free kind of effortless feel to it. You know, it's, yeah. it's not, to, it feels like you're not taking it yourself too seriously. Uh, is that, does that, is that reflected in your writing process when you're writing? Is it, you know, are you, you got a pen and then and you, no, 150%, a lot or you I, don't, kinda... I haven't written down a single thing on that record. Wow. I never wrote a pen to paper. Not once, man. That's just, uh, me and Dan wrote You Got a Man together, so we were kind of going back and forth with notes, but everything else was really like, for most of the, I would say 85% of the record is me with headphones on, just like freestyling, freestyling. over shit until I'm like, oh, that was cool. Like, I'm going to go back and like track that seriously now. Like, it, it's just fucking, that's just how I do it, man. I don't yeah. know. I know people that can write whole songs on paper before they ever even set foot in a studio and i i have too much adhd i just yeah. I gotta be free man i gotta be free on there man <laughs> well it's it, it can't it, hold it, me it, down man it, it 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 creates a whole different vibe you know there's there's these you know lyrics that you can tell were written down beforehand and there's other things that kind of just flow yeah. mo well with the music and i feel like and that's more of the vibe i got from from your music so that's I, oh, it, yeah. it's fun to hear that uh, that is that is your writing process i'm happy that it translates too because when you when you put out a project or a song i feel like you hear it like 800 times before it comes out and it's cool to hear somebody like yourself or anyone that's hearing something for the first time and doesn't know anything about you or the behind the scenes and just giving their opinion of something sure that, that i think is always really interesting yeah you can definitely get too close to a song once you hear it. it's like just just a word say a word 20 times yeah. and, and the word starts to sound weird you don't even know you know because well, you, you gotta even think about it too when you make a record like technically you never just hear your record for the first time ever because each song you worked on it that whole time especially if you're like me or many other artists who like like obviously Rihanna isn't sitting around like producing a bunch of beats and then getting on them, right? She'll probably like go to a studio session, hear a bunch of beats and write a song. But if you, if you're like these weird new DIY artists or whatever, you, each song on that record, I like made from scratch at my house or something. And I heard those all 300 times. Then I had to hear all the mixes like five or six times to give notes. And then the first time that I'm sitting back listening to all the masters, I've heard every song now, like fucking, eight million like you never really just like hear it for what it is for the first time with no other guys like you don't have blinders right. on like i i really wish there was a way to like clear your memory as an artist sometimes to just listen to something completely you're just hearing the master and that's all you've ever heard of it that would just be the coolest that invention yeah a little, a, little, a little men in black mind wipe thing or something yeah you know? just temporarily just for yeah. like 30 minutes so you could hear your record and be like shit well that's that's what someone's gonna hear who's never heard it ever like one thing that i have noticed that helps sometimes is if you get in the room with a friend and you and you ask them to listen to it yeah. especially if you kind of have a connection with that friend because then yeah. you can kind of vicariously listen to it via them you know you can kinda, yeah. you can imagine You're like looking at like. them you know and most yeah. of the time my music's really out there so they're like <laughs> dude like i don't fucking know about this one yeah you can, you can kind of imagine you can put yourself in their shoes a little bit and it helps get get yourself out of your head a little bit but it also can be yeah you know that's good advice i've done that too i do that with like my brother or something me and my brother always do that. he's like yo listen to the song that i made and i'll, have, I'll listen to it because we work in separate studios so he'll like call me up and i'll come up and listen or vice versa for sure well johnny thanks so much for sharing your crazy story man um really hey. I, I feel like, you know, just like your music, uh, you've had a, it, I know it pro probably wasn't effortless, but it seemed like there was a lot of things that went right for you um, at the right Thanks. time, right moment kind of thing. So uh, congrats on all the success. Uh, everyone listening, check out For Abby, the new album just dropped by Johnny two days ago. So fresh, fresh off the presses. Uh, last question, Johnny, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to aspiring artists, what would it be? 
Oh, that's easy, man. Uh, don't don't let all these weird like art rich kids with fancy gear or anything make you scared to get into it. You know what I mean? I'm not even talking about just music. Like, if you want to make YouTube videos, if you want to make movies, if you want to get into painting, if you want to learn how to play the guitar, if you want to be an artist, if you want to produce. Like, if you're, you know, not everyone's in the same situation, but even if you're privileged enough to have an iPhone or something, like, there's people like Steve Lacey that made songs on iPhones. You know what I mean? Like. There's always a way. Don't ever feel like you, if you don't have as much as other people, you can't get into it, man. Cause there's, you can do anything. Like I, like I know I'm in a position right now. I feel like where I used to be really broke in Philadelphia with no money. And I would hear people be like, yo, you can do it, man. Like anyone could do it. And I would always be like, fuck you, man. Like you're up there and you fucking have it now. So like, yeah, you could say that. But now I, it's fucking true, man. Like, cause I, I used to be there listening to these people be like you anyone can do it and i'd be like well fuck i'm working 50 hours a week right now with no end in sight like what do i do and i think it's just important to just stay true to yourself and what you love and if you love something enough you'll do anything in the fucking world to obtain it if you want to be a fucking doctor like go be a doctor dude like just try just fucking find a way don't let anyone tell you you can't don't let money or anything tell you that you can't do it just figure out a fucking way to do it man like that it just there's too many things it, there's too you only live life once you know what i mean there's not there's there's too many things in there out there to do that like people are going to tell you that you can't do it and you know what like if you just try to put the blinders on and don't listen to those people you might fucking come up with something really awesome and beautiful and you might be the best to ever fucking do it for all you know that's that's awesome johnny that's great advice and a lot of times that 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 struggle makes that art even more endearing you know how many bands and or directors do people say oh i love their early stuff better you know what i mean <laughs> they yeah. lost the struggle they lost you know they lost the drive you know so i I, mean, I couldn't write a song for six months when i signed to a major yeah it can be sometimes it's terrifying can be you're, you're like what now it's like you know you're yeah. a quarterback that's trained your whole life to win the fucking super bowl and then you win it and it's like okay now i gotta win it again you know what yeah. i mean like I was really broke and I, I was trying to prove myself and I was just working these shifts and trying to make these songs. And then when you get up there and you're like, oh, now I just, my job is to make songs. It gets a little weird at that point, you know, like everything's different now. Like what's the inspiration now? Like, what do I, you know, you got to find new inspiration and shit like that. Yeah. Wild, wild west. Totally. Yeah. And suddenly you, you don't have any more excuses. You, you got everything you need. So you better. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm just, it, it does that that early on shit sometimes though it's the inspiration thing you know like they're they're hungry and they're struggling they're like i'm finding all this inspiration to write this record and then sometimes you get in a place where you're not financially okay and there is no struggles anymore and then you're you know i'm not all the way there yet but those kind of people up there sometimes i i wonder where i'm like damn maybe they like they found a really hard time to find inspiration to write more things now that they're okay you know Totally. I mean, I, I think especially with rap music and rock and roll, you know, sometimes when the when the guys get too comfortable or too up there, you're like, are you really still, you know, you, rock and roll and rap music? Yeah, a lot of times the danger is the attractive part. But then all, suddenly you're like, well, are you really that dangerous now? <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, you're living in a, in a man. Or even now. even someone like Outkast, Nodger 3000, where they're rapping about very serious things in their life and they're struggling for like 10 years to like prove themselves. And now they have like the biggest songs in the world. It's like, what do I, what do I write about now? Like, yeah. my life is awesome. I got money. Exactly. Like, well, that's that not what a lot of They don't talk like about. that. They don't, they don't <laughs> right. flex like that, you know? Right. And then they're right. sitting up there, millions of dollars, biggest songs in the world. And Andre 2000's like, God, what the fuck do I write about now? It's like, I'm, I'm not yeah. going to be that guy that's like, everything's fine. I yeah. got money now. Like, and at the same time, I remember in an interview hearing him say, and I didn't want to be on the other end of the spectrum and be like, yo, I have a lot of money and I'm rich, but I'm sad. Like, no one wants to hear that either. <laughs> right, like, right. Fuck you, dude. I'm sad and broke. Like, Yeah, I've heard him say a few things. I I, I, I think last I heard, he said he didn't want to rap anymore because he didn't want to be an old rapper. So that's why he's been acting. You know, he yeah, played Jimmy yeah. Hendrix. And, I saw uh, that too. He, he, yeah. that, it, in recent years, he's like, I'm not even trying to rap anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good for him, man. He already paid his dues. Dude, he killed it, man. He's a legend. Bring me a bad word, yeah.